here and what it help, it's helped us to accomplish. So quickly, in 2021, we created the new Rose Island Nature Reserve in Curling Township. This is a very special island. Uh, the reserve protects 286 undeveloped acres of the 400 acre Rose Island, which has long been a priority for conservation due to its ecological significance. The land contains some of the last remaining old growth forest in Southern Ontario, for example, and it has a rare uh, glacial lacustrine mixed hardwood forest ecosystem. Uh, this, this type is rare for Georgian Bay. Sandy Island is another example of this kind of forest habitat. So it's a very special place. Uh, it protects over 10 species at risk. Uh, those inventories will continue, but it's your support that's really helped us create yet another very large uh, protection of nature on Georgian Bay. Two additional properties uh, from last year will soon be announced, including 30 and a half acres of a provincially significant wetland in the Honey Harbor there. Over the past year, we've been updating our ecological mapping of the region as part of a collaborative project to protect species at risk along Georgian Bay, along with other organizations. These maps take into account habitat type connectivity between ecosystem features, threats, including a detailed mapping of invasive frag Phragmites and its proximity to large uh, wetland, uh, inland wetland systems. This kind of mapping allows um, individuals and it allows townships to make wise decisions on conservation of our <coughs> biosphere in the years to come. Each year we work to expand the ways that Georgian Bay Land Trust properties contribute to impactful conservation research and in 2020 we significantly increased our network of MODIS wildlife tracking stations, adding four new stations to the existing five. These stations pick up radio transmitted signals from birds and in insects flying overhead and contribute to a host of studies. Over the coming years, we will see how birds move through the Georgian Bay habitats and contribute to a global effort to identify migratory route and stopover sites and threats to migratory birds. So in closing, uh, Canada's $500 million nature fund remains a once in a lifetime opportunity for donors such as yourselves to conserve large areas with our help on Georgian Bay before they are gone. We're ending our third year of this four year program and this is a fantastic opportunity for you folks to offer your support. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Kenny Ruland. Kenny is the founder of Reptile and Amphibian Advocacy and a frequent contributor to the Georgian Bay Land Trust work. In 2018, Kenny helped us in surveying the Detels Reserve finding four species at risk and was an instrumental partner in 2019 in the process to locate and identify species at risk on the Tadnet Conservation Initiative. These observations are critical for organizations like the Land Trust and we thank Kenny for his relentless and passionate work. So now over to you, Kenny. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes, you can, Kenny. Okay, perfect. So um, thank you for the introduction, Bill. Uh, my name is Kenny Ruland. Um, so we're gonna be talking about snakes in Georgian Bay today. Uh, specifically, we're gonna be talking about um, three species. So they're called um, the big three, we call them, and we'll get into why we call them that in a reason. So as Bill mentioned, um, I initiated the Reptile and Amphibian Advocacy sorry, Project in uh, 2015. So why that was uh, initiated was because I had a very large passion for reptiles and amphibians um, in Eastern Ontario, the Kingston area where I grew up. There wasn't too much going on um, in terms of conservation projects other than uh, like stuff at Queen's University and such. So um, I initiated, and I, sorry, I initiated this project as a, mostly an outreach thing. So for the first few years, we went around and did a lot of outreach education at local schools, um, high schools, conservation areas, and um, herping, which is uh, like a reptile and, and reptile and amphibian enthusiasts version of birding. So herpetology is the study of uh, reptiles and amphibians. So this strange term herp 
uh, that you may hear naturalists say uh, actually refers to reptiles and amphibians. Um, so the first few years, we really started doing outreach, edu um, outreach education, um, and that was great. Uh, you know, we connected with a lot of people, different schools and such, and then we got more involved in field work, which uh, Bill was mentioning there. So for the past few years, we've thankfully uh, been involved with Georgian Bay Land Trust. We've done some absolutely incredible projects. Um, this here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hopefully doing some more this year. Of course, COVID kind of messed that up. Up last year, we weren't be able. To, oops, sorry, weren't able to get over there, unfortunately. Um, but at this point, I'm going to start sharing my presentation for you guys. So I'm going to stop my video just to help the connection. We are going to screen share here. Okay. Present, and there we are. All right. So uh, again, so Reptile Amphibian Advocacy is the project. So we're contributing to the conservation of Ontario's herpetofauna. We do this largely through uh, outreach education, as I mentioned, and the last few years, we've done a lot of boots on ground research, I like to call it. Uh, so it's promoted that, you know, we were gonna talk about all snakes of Georgian Bay. If we did that, we would be here for hours and hours and, uh, I would have a lot to say so, because there are 11 species um, that are local to the Georgian Bay area. So here on this screen, I have all of uh, Ontario's native snake species. There are 17, including the red-sided garter snake, which is a subspecies. Um, so I'm gonna go through quickly and just name off uh, the species that we have in the Georgian Bay area. So the first is the DK's brown snake, um, the eastern fox snake, the eastern garter snake, uh, eastern hognose snake, and the eastern ribbon snake. Uh, again, I, uh, I'm just gonna name them off and we're gonna get into uh, a specific three species here in a moment. The eastern Massasauga rattlesnake, they're also found in the bay, of course. Uh, most of us know that. The eastern milk snake, northern ringneck snake, northern water snake, now, um, the queen snake I highlighted as uh, yellow for uh, them being found somewhat on the outskirts of Georgian Bay. There's a small population in the uh, Bruce Peninsula, but uh, again, that's not exactly considered Georgian Bay. So there is also the red-bellied snake, and last but definitely not least, my uh, personal favorite, the smooth green snake. Now, can everyone see... Um, screen well and everything. I just want to make sure nobody's missing anything here. Uh, and also, I just wanted to mention if there, chat here. All right, perfect. Yes, yes. If there are any questions, um, we are going to save them for the end. And then Sarah is going to read them out. And we will get to we'll get to all of those. So this is what we're going to talk about here is the uh, three so that refers to the massasauga rattlesnake um the eastern hognose snake and the eastern fox snake so there's a few reasons why these are referred to as the big three in the georgian bay area um the first reason is because they're literally three of the largest species in the area um so again i'll get into the sizes of these species when i talk about them specifically in a few moments here um, so again, they're the largest three species, but they're also the three most at risk found in the Georgian Bay area. So uh, that's the reason why there's a lot of conservation initiatives focused on these species. And there's uh, some nice photos for you guys to look at there. On the left, we have a Massasauga that was found um, basking, I think it was early July. Um, we were doing some surveys that time. The bottom photo is the eastern fox snake. And uh, on the right hand side there, we have the eastern hognose snake. I'm just gonna check the chat again. Um, so this slide I believe is gonna be recorded, if that's what you're asking, and posted on Facebook and YouTube at the end, uh, Sarah was telling me. 
All right. So we are going to start with the Massasauga rattlesnake. Um, so again, these these snakes are um, there are only remaining venomous snake species left in Ontario, and the reason I wanted to mention that is because um, we did have two venomous snake species found in the province. Uh, the timber rattlesnake was unfortunately extirpated. Uh, I believe it was like the 1940s or 1950s. I don't have in the slide specifically right now in the Niagara region. So they were last found in uh, like the Niagara Gorge area. Now they were extirpated largely due to, of course, habitat destruction, but direct persecution is what really killed that species off. Um, so I really like talking about that because with the Massasauga being our last famous species, um, we don't want that to happen with these guys. Um, Georgian Bay is a really big stronghold for this species. Um, again, they, they are at risk, but um, there's a decent population of them out there. Of course, it's ever dwindling. But um, again, they're the only venomous snake species left we have in Ontario. And I think that itself is uh, pretty special. And again, this is a pretty docile species. Um, you know, having observed them so many times, it's not like I have ever had a Massasauga um, try to bite me unless I approached it too close, which again, they, they never strike, they always rattle first. Um, there's been a few studies that have been done where, you know, these snakes will not even bite, uh, even when they're directly stepped on. There was a study done where they used a fake boot and they stepped on <laughs> uh, rattlesnakes to see if they would uh, bite or not and see how they reacted. So, uh, the Massasaugas in the Georgian Bay area, which is considered the Great Lakes St. Lawrence, sorry, St. Lawrence population, is listed as threatened. Um, so they're doing slightly better than the uh, populations, sorry, quite a bit better than the populations in Southern Ontario, um, which are listed as endangered. So I'm not gonna get into those populations much because again, we're focusing on uh, the Georgian Bay region here. But in Georgian Bay, they're listed as threatened, so uh, they do need help. And, you know, if we don't help the species um, with some haste, then, you know, they will be also listed as endangered throughout the whole province. Um, so next, I just wanted to talk about how bites from the mass saga are extremely rare. Uh, so there hasn't been a death in Ontario. Um, Again, I didn't put this down. I usually have this written on my slides and I, I know it's been over at least 50 years and uh, anytime there has been a death, uh, it's been because they did not go to the hospital and uh, reach for help. So what happens with bites usually in Ontario when they do happen, it involves young men uh, messing with them and alcohol, of course. So these, this isn't a species that you have to fear. Um, again, they're often hiding away again when, when we're surveys for they're not just hanging out waiting for us a lot of the time it takes a lot of uh, effort and work to locate the species they're extremely cryptic and again you can see these photos here on the right hand side um the one is a photo that we found during a survey on the tadnac property and uh that's one that i almost stepped on you know you hear that very often that People say, oh, you know, I almost stepped on a rattlesnake in, in the Georgian Bay area, but it really was like that. I was actually looking for them specifically, and I went to go hop across um, some barren, and there she was just hanging out between that um, basking. So I'm just going to check the chat here if it will pop up. I'll leave it for now. Um, so the range of the massasauga in the georgian bay area um they pretty much encompass all of georgian bay they're found um manitoulin island they're found down on the bruce peninsula all along the east coast of georgian bay there they go almost up to studbury and uh just above aurelia there it looks like there's some historical sightings if you look at the map provided by ontario nature there um at the bottom it looks like it's covered now they uh, used to range pretty well into Aurelia. Uh, so before I move on to another species, I wanted to talk a bit about their habitat preference. Just gonna look at these comments here. Almost 60 years it's been since there's been a death from a Massasauga from Jeff Hathaway. Thank you so much. 
I figured someone was going to help me out there. Ooh, it looks like there's some comments we're going to have to get to. So yeah, you know, um, again, these snakes are extremely cryptic. So uh, I see a comment here, someone saying that they almost stepped on one uh, quite a few times this summer. Uh, again, that does happen when you're in the Georgian Bay area. You just have to be aware that these animals are in the area. Uh, we'll save that stuff for the end there though. So back to uh, Massasauga habitat preference. So most often these snakes are found in rock barren. Um, so the photo on the top there was a Massasauga found on a rock barren. She was just basking on a pile of pines. You can see a rock shelf uh, behind her there. Below that, we have a Massasauga sitting in uh, sphagnum bog. So this is something that people don't really realize is that this species relies heavily on uh, bogs and fens. So they overwinter in this sphagnum moss in uh, hummocks. So when we're doing uh, spring surveys for this species, which is what you're seeing here, um, this one was found in a hummock and uh, it was really, really cool. It was my first time seeing one curled up like that in sphagnum. And uh, the photo beside that here is a purple pitcher plant that is in bloom. So it has flower coming out there. Um, and that's just another example of some bog habitat. So I'm gonna move on here to the next species. Oh, there we go. All right, uh, the Eastern hognose snake. So this is uh, many people's favorite snake for good reason. Um, you know, for a snake, a lot of people won't say that they're cute, but they really do look quite cute uh, with their little pig face. And uh, they are quite the drama queens as well. So one thing I wanted to touch on is that they're considered uh, the rarest terrestrial snake in mainland Ontario. And I say mainland because of course we have the racers, which are extremely rare. Um, now this quote came out of the Snakes of Ontario book. Um, that is the absolute Bible to uh, snakes in Ontario. If you ever have the chance to get your hand on that book, I suggest that you do. Uh, there's a wealth of knowledge in there. It's, it's uh, definitely something to have on your shelf. Uh, and again, that's a quote from that book directly, is that uh, they're considered the rarest terrestrial snake in Ontario. And, and, and what that means is that they're so hard to find. So we're not saying that, um, you know, their population is uh, less than another species by chance, because again, they're not listed as endangered, but they're extremely, extremely cryptic and hard to find. Um, and that's why this is mentioned. I also got some comments. Uh, the book is, I know Jeff Hathaway could help me with this as well. It's called The Snakes of Ontario. Uh, yeah, it's, it's available from the Friends of Algonquin Park. Now the author is, um, the last name is Raoul. I'm very sorry that I can't remember his first name. Jeff Rowell, exactly. I was, I was going to say that, but I wasn't sure if that was your name uh, popping up in my head there, Jeff. So uh, I, I wish I had that book on me. I actually don't have it right now. It's in storage um, because I wanted to put that quote directly on this, on this slide. Um, so next, they are listed as threatened, as I mentioned. So this is through all of Ontario. Um, they don't split up the designations um, in their different populations with them. They're, Again, hognose snakes are really, really strange snakes. Um, even if you're in an area that you know there's a decent population, uh, for example, there's a population in central Ontario. Uh, a couple friends and I found what we thought was a healthy, a, a healthy population of them in a particular spot. We would go and see a couple every time we went uh, for about a year's span, and we haven't seen any there for about four years since. So they're really, really hit and miss. Um, they're a snake where you really need to understand their behavior to uh, find them, or you just do it randomly. So of course, we're going to talk about their dramatic defensive display. Um, so the photo I have there of the hognose on sand, he is uh, hooding up. So this is actually one that we found in that central Ontario population. Uh, and the reason I use this photo as well is because the cover phase. So it's kind of that gray, brown buff with a bit of yellow 
uh, on the hood there. So this is typical of the Georgian Bay area. Um, they're not as colorful up there at all. They're usually uh, gray in color. They'll be slate gray with no pattern. They're extremely variable, which means that they come in all different colors and patterns. Um, and this is something I also wanted to discuss in this in this slide is, you know, identifying these different species um, because species like the hognose can be quite variable and some of these species even look alike to one another. So this guy's hooding up like a cobra. Uh, you'll sometimes hear people call them the um, hissing adder or puffing adder, which makes people believe that they're venomous. They, of course, are not. Um, if you really, really bug a hognose, so this guy, he's hissing very, very loudly as well while he's flattening out like this. So he's hissing loudly, he's huffing, he's, pu he's puffing, he's flattening out to make himself look larger. Uh, if that doesn't work, the photo below here is a photo of uh, a yearling hognose that is playing dead. So that was found on my first trip to meet um, Georgian Bay Land Trust. I did Blazing Star Environmental. Um, on some species at risk surveys in that area, we were targeting uh, rattlesnakes. We came across this uh, small individual one day up on a rock bearing, the mossy rock bearing you can see there. And again, different individuals have different personalities. This one played dead instantly. Um, we didn't touch it, we didn't do anything, we just walked by it and it, it pretended to uh, play dead. Just gonna check it with chat here again let's see what people are saying the color coding oh yeah someone wants me to explain the color coding there so the hog nose do not, does not rattle uh but when it hisses of course it can sound like a rattlesnake um and that's another reason why this species is often thought to be venomous and they're often killed unfortunately uh, so I, I, I do want to I do want to note uh, note that uh, this color coding here uh, this map by Ontario Nature. So the red squares are historical sightings. So what that means is this is where um, the eastern hognose has been observed in uh, I believe it's over 20 years. So if it was 20 years or longer in that square, um, that square will be colored red. The green means they have been found there historically and recently. And then the yellow means they've been found um, very recently, excuse me. Bottom of the presentation is cut off. There you go. You guys should be able to see it now. And if you look in the chat too there, um, Jeff has provided uh, a legend to the color coding there. So before I move on from the hognose here, uh, I just want to talk about their habitat preference a little bit. So the top photo uh, is a really, really good example. So they love these soils and that's because they, uh, they prey on toads mostly. That's uh, what they eat in Ontario is toads and maybe some frogs as well. Um, so they're usually in this loamy, sandy habitat. And when you don't find them in areas like that on the bay, which there is quite a bit of, uh, the two bottom photos, you can see some mossy habitat, which is high up um, in some pine forest. So they, they really, really like conifers and moss. And then the right hand photo on the bottom is an open barren. You can find hognose in those areas as well. <clears throat> so we're gonna move on to the uh, Eastern Fox snake here. All right, um, so we're going to be talking about the fox snake now. Now, this is, again, one of my favorite species. Well, all, all of these, of, of course, are because they're all such incredible snakes. Uh, do hognose live on Manitoulin Island? Yes, they do. They definitely do. Uh, so if we go back for one second. I don't see, I don't think I see any squares over there. Um, I am quite positive they're found on Manitoulin. Uh, Jeff, maybe you can confirm that for me. So we're gonna be talking about the fox snake now. Uh, so these guys are really, really interesting in the Georgian Bay area. 
so they're considered like the coastal population of fox snakes. If you look at the map down below here, uh, where they're found, they're only found along the eastern coast of Georgian Bay. So they stick to that coastline. Um, they love water in the southern populations. They're considered more of um, like a wetland species, I would say. They'll, they'll be found along the coasts of Lake Erie and um, marshes and stuff like that in southern Ontario. And then up in Georgian Bay, they stick along the coast. Uh, they do a lot of swimming between the islands. So uh, there's a couple of papers out there that mention of them swimming several kilometers between islands to reach hibernacula, which is really, really incredible. Uh, they're incredible climbers as well. So the fox snake is a species of rat snake, of course. Um, you can see a photo of them climbing up here. So that one's actually from Peely Island. I don't have too many photos of uh, coastal fox snakes other than this one down here, which is pretty awesome, actually. Um, we walked up on that one in 2019 doing surveys for the Tadnac Initiative. And that, that, that's as found right there. I hadn't even touched that snake yet at all. Um, we did end up picking it up to take some photos and such, um, which we had permits for, but uh, that, was, that was incredible. So that's their typical habitat is the coastline of Georgian Bay, as you can see uh, down here. So a really interesting fact about the fox snake is that approximately 70% of their range is found in Ontario. So they're found in um, some states, like eastern states along the Great Lakes as well. Uh, but they're doing the best here in Ontario. I just want to check out the chat one time. So yeah, apparently there are no hognose on Mantua, and that's very strange because I've always heard of it being such a out of this place for herps. Um, so the eastern fox snake is listed as threatened in the Georgian Bay, which is again the Great Lakes St. Lawrence population, and once again endangered in the Carolinian population because everything down south is not doing well at all. Of course, that's uh, largely due to development and you know, the agriculture down there. Um, not to mention uh, people also killing snakes out of fear. So another really interesting thing about fox snakes is that they're actually our third largest snake species. So they can reach lengths of over five feet. It's pretty rare. Usually they're a lot smaller, around like four, four and a half. Um, our fox snakes up here also get larger than anywhere else. So that's pretty interesting. Um, the more north uh, reptile species range, typically the larger they get. Chat's going off here and check it out. Um, so yeah, fox snakes are really interesting. Someone mentioned, uh, uh, they asked about their diet. So fox snakes largely are mammal eaters, I know. Um, actually, I'm going to... Uh, show you guys something here. I wanted to um, shout out Steve Marks, if you guys can see my video here. This is a shirt that I um, uh, the legendary Steve Marks. It's a fox snake, a famous fox snake named Buddy that he uh, tracked for over 10 years. And it says, oh, for fox snakes with uh, the green heart that Steve loves, of course. Um, so I'm just even such, you know, um, fox snakes mostly eat uh, mammals. So as they're young, they can eat small voles and uh, mice, rats, and I'm not sure if they can get large enough to eat squirrels, really. Oh, there's some drawing on there. Oh, someone's drawing on our slides, I think. Um, yeah, so fox snakes are largely uh, rodent eaters. They also prey heavily on birds. Um, so I, I know in Georgian Bay, they, uh, eat a lot of bird eggs and bird nestlings. So uh, with all the um, shore, shoreline birds and uh, waterfowl that breed in Georgian Bay, they are nest raiders. So they go in and eat the eggs and the nestlings. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, I'm gonna talk about for the fox snake for now. Let's go to the chat.
Okay, I'm uh, going to move on here. Again, sorry about the drawings on our slide there. Looks like somebody did that. I'm not sure how. Uh, so next I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work we've done with uh, GBLT, which is Georgian Bay Land Trust, hosting this, and uh, some field stories with them as well. <laughs> now Mark, now Mac is drawing on the slide, great. Uh, so my first experience with Georgian Bay Land Trust was volunteer surveys with Blazing Star Environmental, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we were surveying for Massasauga rattlesnakes and we actually, this is how we met uh, the folks at GBLT, is that we visited an island to do an outreach event to talk about reptiles in Georgian Bay and uh, people kayaked up to the island. It was really, really cool actually. Um, within a few minutes we were there, we found this eastern fox snake that I'm holding there on the side and a five-lined skink. I'm just gonna check the chat here again. So we have a lot of uh, questions coming. I'm not sure if you're uh, keeping up with all this here, so yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah, so there's me with the fox snake in 2017 with uh, Hannah McCurdy Adams. Shout out to Hannah. She, I uh, really, really look up to her in the field. She has been fantastic to me over the past few years, um, provided a lot of opportunities to me, and she's a great mentor if you can ever get into the field with Hannah. Uh, next here on the right is when we surveyed the uh, details and Kaufman reserves that Bill was actually mentioning in 2018. Now we did uh, locate four species at risk, and I think it was the musk turtle, uh, the eastern musk turtle, which is listed as um, special concern right now. They would be listed from threatened a few years ago. This eastern milk snake, which was also unfortunately um, delisted in Ontario, they're no longer listed as a species at uh, species um, at risk provincially, are listed federally. Um, we found a painted turtle. And that's it. We didn't really find too much. It was extremely hot on that trip, I remember, but it was fantastic. Um, thanks again to Georgian Bay for bringing us out for those. They treated us very well. So next is the uh, Tadanac uh, Conservation Initiative that we were um, involved in in 2019. Sorry, just looking at the chat here again. Uh, so yeah, this project here, um, it was an absolute honor to be involved in this in 2019. Um, again, unfortunately, we couldn't get out uh, last year to do any surveys, but this is some of the, my favorite work I've ever done. Um, in it was absolutely incredible. We went out to this, again, you can see a little uh, excerpt I took from the website there. It's this incredible, incredible large property um, south of 12 Mile Bay. And we were doing species at risk surveys for a few weeks there. Um, we were there in early spring. We went back in midsummer, I believe. And uh, the biodiversity was just incredible. It's truly untouched land. The only people that go there are um, anglers and hunters. And uh, we had the privilege of surveying this land and um, seeing some really, really incredible things. So a few of those things were, uh, sorry for the slightly gruesome pick, but I, it's quite interesting. So one day we were out, it was a particularly snaky day that day. We found a few massive sagas. Uh, I think that's the same day we got a couple fox snakes on Bill's property. Um, and then we came across another species, which we weren't having too much luck with there. Not that it's a species at risk anymore, unfortunately. But the uh, milk snake down here. So. I came up on this large milk snake sprawled out on a log with its head missing, um, which likely, uh, I'm guessing you know, must have got to it or something, or even a chipmunk. Chipmunks are known to eat the heads off of snakes and then just leave them. So that was kind of interesting. Down below here is a snake species that actually, if you guys can hear me um, well enough, if you guys want to try to ID that snake in my hands here before I identify it. Um, I will let you do that. We found that snake in a fen one day looking for turtles. Over here we have uh, the Massasauga that I had posted on the um, 
on the slide that I started out with, just from a top angle. And I was telling you guys, like I almost stepped on her. Um, you can see how cryptic their camouflage really can be. Up in the top here is a photo of me with a very large snapping turtle out on the bog um, that Bill made me pose for. So he po I posed for him. He took this photo of this snapping turtle that wasn't too happy for us. Um, sorry about us taking its voucher shot. So we had uh, Amy Huff guess, oh, it wasn't Amy's story. It was Michael Duder, I believe you pronounce it. Uh, guess Ribbon Snake, and he's correct. So you probably can't see it very well, but it's right in front of the eye there. Oh, there's a white crest in front of the uh, Ribbon Snake's eye, which is how you di differentiate them from the Eastern Garter Snake. Underneath their lateral stripe, which is this yellow stripe here, it's uh, somewhat of a maroon, reddish color. Um, now again, garter snakes can have that as well because they're really variable. So you what, what you want to look out for is um, the really, really sleek body. Uh, some people call them HD garter snakes, like high definition garter snakes because their stripes are so clean. Um, and then their head, this is something that I noticed that I never see in literature that I think should be actually is that their head almost always, uh, compared to their body, is usually a black color, at least in the Eastern Ontario, like uh, South Frontenac area. They're often like that jet black and it turns into a light brown color on their head. Uh, if anyone else notices that, that does field work, let me know in the comments because I never see people mention it and I think it's a really big ID factor. Um, and I can like, like you know, I can eye them like that in the field, looking at that compared to trying to look at a little white crest in front of the eyeball. Down here, lastly, is a photo of me way out in the bog that um, either Caitlin or Siobhan likely took. Um, yeah, I was pretty in there at that point looking for turtles. Don't think I got any. Then check out the chat. Um, one second. I didn't realize that participants had their video on. Sorry, how was what allowed, Patrick? Didn't quite get that there. All right, so we're gonna move on from this. Um, so next I wanted to introduce a, um, a project that is based in Georgian Bay. Um, so this is important because uh, Ontario Nature, their Reptile Amphibian Atlas, which is a program that you could um, submit your observations to, uh, and they would send them to um government authorities and there was that whole map that i had set out with all the species that showed you where they're found um it, it unfortunately got cancelled so now people sending in their observations they have to send it to iNaturalist or um nhic directly and uh, that's not ideal for the lake community so i'd like to introduce um the cares project which was presented by uh Scales Nature Park, which is based in Aurelia, Ontario. Um, so they do really great work. They run the Start Turtle Project. Jeff Hathaway, that you may have seen in the comments there, um, he founded this, Scales Nature Park. Um, so two of their projects are the Start Turtle Project. Not going to talk about that too much. That's pretty well known in the Georgian Bay area. They have signs everywhere. Um, they collect thousands and thousands of eggs from the roadside. Uh, every year and incubate them, release them to the wild in the Georgian Bay area. Um, they also recently opened up the Georgian Bay Turtle Hospital, which now you can um, send in injured turtles to and they will uh, fix them up and release them as well. So if you guys live in Georgian Bay and you frequently see reptiles, um, specifically uh, 
the big three, those snakes that we're talking about, the Massasauga, the Eastern Fox Snake, and the Eastern Hognose Snake, those are the snakes that the Georgian Bay Cares Project, which stands for Conservation, Action, Research, and Education about Snakes. Um, they initiated this last year, I believe. We were lucky enough to join them for some work, and it was really incredible. We got to check out some baby Massasaugas. Uh, I encourage you guys to save this reptile hotline. They will come out on the spot to um, capture these animals and process them to contribute, uh, again, to a better understanding of these species. So there's permits for this. Of course, they come with their equipment. Um, they're trained on this. And it's really cool if, if it's on your property or something, you can watch them do it as well. Um, so I just wanted to give them a shout out in hopes that that gives them some some more um, some more hotline calls this year. And this just shows some photos and some of the work that they do. It was focused on the mass saga, the uh, hog nose and fox snake, as I mentioned. And um, what they do is research local populations, reduce threats, and protect habitat. Uh, and they also engage the public. So again, this is all done by researching these species, doing outreach education. You can see some photos at the bottom there. It uh, looks like they have a massive saga rattlesnake in a tube. So that's how we safely uh, like take blood and measure it and do all those sorts of nitpicky things with the venomous snake safely. Um, it looks like in the middle photo there, Taylor Kennedy is maybe measuring a snake. It looks like a young massive saga. And then over here we have a large hognose snake. Um, that Sam McCall is holding. And actually, uh, she told me about this story. They found this gigantic hognose snake swimming um, in the open water in Georgian Bay, which is pretty, <laughs> quite the incredible observation, because that's not common. The snake hotline will not deliver the snake to you. They may take them away shortly, but they'll be brought right back. Thank you, Jordan, for mentioning uh, the ribbon snake there. Um, so another project that I wanted to shout out is the CNPP project that um, uh, Bill brought to my attention and just kind of slipped my mind there, which is a huge um, project happening in Georgian Bay right now. So it's a community nominated priority place project. So it's four years federally, fun uh, federally funded between several different organizations in Georgian Bay that are all doing incredible work. Um, so, and again, all this is largely focused on reptiles and amphibians because they are so at risk in Ontario. I think it's 75% of our reptiles and 35% of our amphibians are currently listed as nationally or um, provincially at risk in some designation, which means special concern, threatened or endangered. So um, they, they really, really need our help. So I think that's all I have to say right now uh, for the presentation. I got one more slide just with my organization's logo and the website. Um, we're mostly active on Facebook right now. It's where I post all of our field work and stuff like that. Um, it's just easier to stay active on there. Um, the website is there as well. So we do offer outreach education. Um, and of course, we're getting more serious about consulting now. So you guys can always contact us there. Uh, so Sarah, if you can hear me, I think I'm going to share my video and then open up the chat. Great. Thanks, Kenny. Um, so everyone, Perfect. if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box and I will read those out to Kenny. Um, yeah, let's start that's with a lot there. Start with a few that came in during the presentation. Um, first of all, Tom's wondering, can you tell us more about why these snakes are threatened? Um, so there's a myriad of reasons really, right? So um, I guess I'll just do the main few. So a big one right now um, that we're just starting to look at like seriously, and there's a lot of work thankfully being done is uh, road mortality, right? So there's huge, huge road mortality going on. Um, all over. Sorry, Delaney's in the background there. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of road mortality going on. 
um, all over Ontario. So roads are by uh, sorry, bisecting habitat throughout the province. Um, so not only does this, you know, cause habitat destruction, but then these animals are getting killed while they're trying to cross between these different habitats. Um, so road mortality is a big one. Um, another one, again, that I kind of mentioned, habitat destruction. Uh, and people with snakes, um, specifically, people don't like snakes, right? So they're the one species that still face, um, like, you know, direct persecution. So they're commonly killed all the time. Um, just due to people not liking them, not understanding them. So that's why this outreach education is uh, so important, right? All right, um, next question. Do snakes have nerves in their scales? Um, I don't think they have nerves in their scales as they're made out of keratin, like our uh, fingernails or hair, right? So they don't have nerves in their scales, but they can definitely feel through their scales, um, for sure. Okay, great. Um, question coming back to you talking about chipmunks eating the heads of snakes. Are the snakes just alive it. when this happens? Yeah, yeah, no, that happens commonly. Usually it's smaller snake species like garter snakes or, um, you know, red-bellied snakes and brown snakes, but they'll commonly uh, just eat the heads because, of course, the brain is quite nutritious, I believe is what it is, and they just leave the rest of the body, and they are alive when they do this. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting, but they're not as cute as cuddly as you think, maybe. Um, a couple of questions coming in about identifying Massasauga rattlesnakes versus fox snakes and milk snakes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and I did want to touch on the presentation. Just, of course, there's a lot to go over. Um, so, with Massasaugas, they're uh, a really, really small snake species. Uh, not small, but smaller than most of our snakes. Um, they only reach about two feet in length, but they're extremely uh, girthy and wide-bodied, right? So uh, that's that's the one factor of how you can ID, for example, like a Massasauga or a fox snake. They're going to be really, really short, stout snake. Of course, they uh, most times have a rattle at the end of their tail. Now, that's something I should touch on is that uh, rattlesnakes sometimes will lose their rattle, actually, um, on the end of their tail. So you may come across a Massasauga one day um, that cannot rattle and you need to understand that, you know, just because it doesn't have a rattle doesn't mean that it's not a rattlesnake. Uh, so you have to rely on other things like um, their scales and their pattern. Um, so with their scales, <clears throat> this is one good way to differentiate different species is uh, snakes have what is called a like, keeled scales. So on their scale, they'll have a ridge um, in the middle of each scale. And if you look this up, um, you'll see there's many examples out there. So if you think of a garter snake or a water snake, um, they have keeled scales. So they're rough to the touch and they actually look like they would feel rough when you look at them from a distance as well. You can see these keels on the scales. Um, a fox snake and a milk snake, for example, do not have keeled scales. Um, I think fox snakes have weakly keeled scales, but we'll just not count that. Um, if you if you feel these snakes or you look at them, they have a glossy, shiny uh, look to them, and they feel extremely smooth. And that's why people think snakes are slimy, right? Because they sometimes have this sheen to them. Um, so again, it, it really has to do with pattern size. You, you, you have to look at a lot of different things. Um, but when you're in the Georgian Bay area, how you can tell them apart, again, you have to look at the habitat, um, the size of the animal and stuff. So with fox snakes, they have that beautiful orange, like bright orange head, usually a tan to yellow body, um, and black saddles down their dorsal, so down the top, right? Um, Massasaugas, whereas they're more of like a brown, tan color. Um, again, dark saddles, so that's where people can get confused, but they're much smaller, much stouter. Um, and again, a lot of people will try to use the triangular head thing as an ID for venomous snakes in the Massasauga, which I try not to mention because, um, you know, any snake when they're um, feeling defensive, they can flatten out their head and look like that as well. So really, you I, I, I suggest just doing a little bit of research, downloading an app that, um, you know, you can compare these different species 
um, and you should definitely get a hang of it. Um, okay, there's a couple questions. There's a, a story that goes around Georgian Bay a lot that um, rattlesnakes and fox snakes don't share the same habitat. And if you see one, you won't see the other. Can you comment on whether that's true or not? Um, but they also have rallies that are confident. To them. So they, they can be found together in the same habitats for sure. Uh, again, with the fox snakes, they're mostly found along the coast. Um, you'll find them much farther than that, but mass sagas are commonly found along the coast as well. Um, you know, basking on the barren or hiding under juniper bushes and stuff like that, or around cottages. Um, so they do share the same habitat. It's just, uh, again, they might utilize different parts of this habitat at different times. Okay, great. Um, a couple of people wondering about populations of rodents versus um, snakes that um, someone's commented that last summer they had lots of mice but fewer snakes. Um, or is that related? And someone else is wondering um, when you're talking about chipmunks eating snakes, would a lot of rodents mean the snake population would go down or would it go up because I'd like to eat the rodents? For sure. Um, I would think, you know, uh, chipmunks aren't like affecting uh, snake populations. It's, it's nothing like that. It's just, uh, it's just a natural part of their diet, which like sometimes happens. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a chipmunk researcher, you know, but I do know they, they do eat snakes for sure. Um, the odd time now with like the fluctuations of rodents and snakes, of course, that's natural in years with weather fluctuations and stuff like that. Um, with more prey items usually means more predators so i would think if you have more mice in your property that year you will have more um snakes around hopefully to to take care of them and um and and that's something to touch on too you know snakes um don't really get the credit that they deserve so in ontario we have a really big lyme disease problem of course so people don't realize that these snakes are really helping us take care of this because when they're predating these small mammals um, they're inadvertently also consuming ticks, right? So there's a study done in the States where um, timber rattlesnakes, they can consume up to like 4,500 ticks in a single year just from consuming their prey and doing their, their, their you know, daily duties. So that's really, really interesting for sure. Um, some questions about the movements of rattlesnakes. Do they tend to come back to the same spot every year? Um, how far do they move? Can you relocate one without harming it? And if so, how far? Um, so snake, reptiles in general and amphibians are animals of habit. Um, so they often are going to return to the same spots every year. Um, so this is called like site fidelity. So for example, a uh, massasauga, a gestating massasauga, which is a female that's um, incubating her babies, right? Um, so I just reading some comments there. Um, they're gonna go back to that gestation site yearly. So you really can't move reptiles and, and, and by law, you're not supposed to move them um, over a kilometer. I suggest just leaving them alone, especially if it's a massive saga, that's, that's when people get days when you're messing with them. Um, you just need to be aware that they're there uh, I'm not too sure exactly on the home range on a massive saga, but it looks like Jeff is saying uh, the average home range size is about one square kilometer. So, so yeah, again, you, you, you don't know how far away the edge of its home is, so you don't want to be removing um, snakes from your property unless, you know, it's an immediate threat to uh, like a pet or something like that, then there are safe ways that you can do it. Put it in a tall um, garbage bin and move it just a few meters away off your property would be your best bet. But again, these animals are going to return um, every time because that's what they do naturally, right? So, so yeah, they have high site fidelity. They're going to go back to their sites. That's why you see turtles every year. You may have a turtle nesting on your property. It's going to return there almost every year as long as nothing changes, right? Um, Kenny, there's a question about um, the different ways that snakes give birth. Can you talk about uh, those that give live birth versus laying eggs? Yeah, so um, some of our snakes on Ontario lay uh, eggs and some have live birth. So like our massasaugas, for example, they have live birth. So um, they gestate their babies within them and then they um, will give birth 
in late summer. Uh, and Massasaugas are pretty interesting. Actually, they show like a little bit of parental care. You can almost consider it as uh, the, the babies will stick around the mother for the first couple of days, they shed, and then they finally head off. And it's actually been shown that when the mother goes to uh, their hibernacular, the babies will follow the scent trail. So that's, that's pretty cute and really interesting, actually. Um, okay, there's a couple of questions here about snakes fighting each other. Someone um, has a video that they believe are two male fox snakes fighting each other. Um, there's another question about whether male and female snakes will fight. Do you know anything about that? Um, I'm not sure about like combat behavior within any species in Ontario. It's possible that uh, it's possible that species of rat snakes might do it. Um, I guess, yeah, so just as fox snakes, they are known to combat. So rattlesnakes this is common with, and I know like some rat snake species, like I guess the fox snake. Um, so they will fight, I suppose. I don't know much about that myself. Um, if they want to forward the video to myself or Scales Nature Park, we can check it out and try to figure out if it's um, a male and a female or two males fighting. Um, Follow-up question about um, eggs versus live birth. Do any of the snakes you spoke about today lay eggs? Uh, um, so the fox snake, they do lay eggs, and the hog snake lays eggs. <laughs> I'm not even sure what I said there. The hog nose snake um, also lays eggs, and the, the massasauga has life for it. Okay, great. Um, rattlesnake habits, do they come out more at night? Um, what do they eat? I think those are the, yeah, those are the two questions that have come in. Um, so rattlesnakes, I'm um, pretty sure they're considered crepuscular, so they come in the evenings and dawns when they're most active. Uh, again, this the season changes this, right? So um, late summer, you get massasaugas really active on those hot nights, traveling across roads and stuff. Um, that's when you get a lot of road mortality. Um, in the spring, you know, we're finding them in, in the bogs where they're just coming out of their hibernacula and they're hanging out. So you can really find them any time of the day it just uh they're gonna be in different places different time of the day and different time of the year um okay there's another question do you feel that direct persecution of snakes is declining is there any data on this um and have um, you heard of any awareness from any businesses that are involved like real estate development pest control i've never heard of any um promotion from like real estate or pest control or anything like that um definitely uh, I, I think I think you could confidently say that it is likely going down because there's a lot more education and people are starting to care a bit more about our species at risk. Um, again, stuff like this is really, really important, just educating people and, um, you know, just showing them that snakes aren't so bad and that they do need our help. That's a big part of it right there. Um, okay, and then there's another question about who should we report sightings to? Um, and does iNaturalist compromise the safety of threatened species by revealing locations? Sorry, can you uh, just kind of repeat that one a bit again? Uh, so question uh, where, where people should report sightings of these species and does iNaturalist compromise the safety of threatened species by revealing locations? Um, so iNat, they will, um, they will obscure observations of species at risk, so they do that for you. So I don't think there's uh, too much harm in sending it into INAT. That's kind of our best bet right now. You can also obscure your own observations, so that's a good bet. Um, but other organizations that you can, again, uh, send it to is the hotline that I put out. So Scales Nature Park, the um, their CARES project, the START project. These are two projects in the Georgian Bay area that you can um, send it to you. can send your observations also directly to NHIC. Um, so there is many organizations that will accept your, your observations and, and make sure they're, they're sent in. Um, there's a question about different types of rattlesnakes. Can you tell us, are there different types? Different types of rattlesnakes? There are, yeah, there is. Uh, I don't know how many different types there are off top because venomous species aren't really like my niche. Um, but uh, we only have one left here in Ontario, as I mentioned. So we had the timber rattlesnake in Ontario. They're now um, no longer here. And we have only the massasauga left. So 
So we want to make sure that we don't extirpate our mass dog or rattlesnakes. Um, do you know of a good ID poster that people could purchase for snakes? Uh, yeah, so Toronto Zoo, actually, they, uh, I think they're like $2 a piece. They might even just send you some for free. Sometimes they do. Um, they have great identification posters at Toronto Zoo uh, for all of our native reptiles, amphibians, and their larval stages. Okay, great. Um, okay, we've got time for just a couple more questions. Uh, Nancy is wondering, she's got a large black snake who likes her compost barrel. It's in the Georgian Bay area. She thinks it looks like a gray rat snake. Could you tell her what it is likely to be? Um, so there is no rat snakes in the Georgian Bay area, but what your large black snake could be, um, it could be a hogno snake, uh, cause they have that gray phase with no pattern. If you have a photo of it, that would be fantastic to send either myself or someone. Um, but it could also be maybe a water snake. And I see someone mention that as well, cause they, uh, you know, sometimes water snakes have a heavy pattern, so they have banding on them. Sometimes they have no pattern at all, and they're just that, just that gray color. All right, I think we've, oh, can you talk a little bit about dogs and snakes? Are snakes likely to be, fox snakes likely to be leaving a place because there are dogs around? Um, and then, of course, there's questions about, um, about rattlesnakes and pets. Um, so with pets and stuff, you know, the best you can really do is, um, just keep an eye on them. You know, um, if you live in the Georgian Bay area and you know, there's rattlesnakes there, uh, I, I wouldn't leave them unattended around your property. Maybe you could have a fenced in area. Uh, you just have to be aware really, you know, these, these animals aren't going to come after your pets, but, um, they are there. So you just have to be aware and, um, just be vigilant, right? But again, coming across one is pretty rare and you should consider yourself lucky if you do uh, see one. And someone okay. mentioned that uh, the what the lady saw in her compost may sound like a melanistic garter. That is a possibility, which is when it's a garter snake that looks all black. Um, but I don't know of any observations of really any in Georgian Bay. So I think it's kind of unlikely, unlikely um, but it is a possibility for sure. All right, well, we're at 11 o'clock. Thank you everyone for all your questions. And thank you, Kenny. Um, if there are more questions that you'd like to send us after the talk, please go ahead and um, send those to us by email or on social media and we'll, we'll do our best to answer those. Um, I'm just gonna hand it over to my coworker, Janet, for some closing remarks. Um, but thank you so much, Kenny, this has been great. Perfect, yeah. Thank you so much everyone for joining and thank you, Sarah. Hi. Echo the uh, thank yous, Kenny. That was amazing. Great information and uh, very informative and teaching us a lot about snakes. And thank, thank you, you so to everybody much. here today on this call. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the Georgian Bay Land Trust. So from one single property in 1991 to 64 now, it's a, an amazing accomplishment. We'll be celebrating this milestone throughout the year. So we'll have details to follow as the year progresses. I just wanted to say that your commitment and belief in the Georgian Bay Land Trust is really what makes the Land Trust so special. Together, we can protect and preserve these very special wilderness places for generations to come. But we can't do it without your help. And so we're asking you today to please consider putting the Georgian Bay Land Trust on your consideration list. We need your support to continue our important conservation work. Next month, our guest speaker is Stuart McKenzie and he's an amazing bird expert and he has conducted a wide variety of research across the western hemisphere and he will thrill and delight us all with his knowledge and impressive photographs so we hope we will join you uh next on saturday march 20th at 10 a.m for those heading outside into nature today have a wonderful day for those with a cup of coffee in your hand enjoy that's it for now have a wonderful day Thank you, Janet. Thanks, Kenny. Yeah, for sure. It was uh, an honor, like always. Well, I hope we get you out on the bait early this year. 
Oh, I do too. We can only all pray that COVID is going to ease up on us, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, if not, you know, we'll all make do as always, right? Exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, yeah, if anyone has any last questions that you want to throw out before I leave, I'll probably be hanging out here for another minute or two. Just checking out some comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'll send out a thank you to everybody with all the links and the um, references that you made, Kenny, to different organizations where they can pick up information as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That will be great. Um, okay. And yeah, again, guys, if uh, you do live in the Bay Area and uh, you do see these species often, um, you know, go ahead and um, try to submit it to one of those suggested organizations because it really does make a big difference. So. Okay, is that it? I think that's it, guys. Thanks for joining, everybody. All right. Bye, folks. Thank you so much.